Graag heet ik. I would like to welcome you to the second part of the online program coming to you from the Royal Academy of Arts and Sciences. Today we present the most important conclusion of the research Independence, Decolonization, Violence and War in Indonesia, a joint program of three institutes. The Royal Institute of Southeast Asian and Caribbean Studies, the Royal Netherlands Institute for Military History, and the uh, NEOD Institute for War, Holocaust and Genocide Studies. This research was conducted over the course of four and a half years by a team of 25 Dutch researchers divided across eight different research projects. In some of these projects, close collaboration took place with foreign colleagues, amongst which a team of Indonesian historians. From the research program, a total of 14 publications will come, of course, excluding translations. The most important outcomes of the research have been brought together in this book. Beyond the Pale, Dutch extreme violence in the Indonesian independence war. This publication will be published in English. The Indonesian translation will follow later. After or next to this overview, we will have four sub-studies who are also published today. And as of the 1st of March, all these editions will be made available digitally and are free of charge and accessible to everyone. I would now like to give the floor to Gert Oostindi, director of the KIT LV, Ben Schoemaker, uh, director of NIMH, and Frank van Vrij, program director, and until the 1st of September last year, director of NIOT. Together, they will talk you through the most important conclusions in the coming 20 minutes, and then there will be time to ask questions until one o'clock. Frank, over to you. Thank you, Mariette Wolf. In 1969, India veteran Joop Huting, in a very uh, important interview, stated that he and other military in that time had committed war crimes. The government then had a sources investigation conducted and came to the conclusion that during the war in the years 1945-1949, excesses took place, but quoting that the military as a whole had behaved correctly. That government position from 1969 since then was not reviewed. Over the last years, however, strong indications surfaced because of media and uh, court cases, especially those cases that were uh, brought to court by the Dutch Depths of Honor um, Committee by Jeffrey Pondag, it became clear that military used uh, extreme violence on a much larger scale than was previously thought and admitted. Society and the scientific world insisted more and more in research, more research into the behavior of the Dutch military. At the beginning of 2017, therefore, they decided to make available uh, funds to make the research program possible. This program started, as said, in 2017, and today we present to you the most important conclusions. And this was six months later, as planned, as a consequence of the pandemic, and uh, because of that reason, archives were locked down and also field research could not take place in Indonesia. The research program can be subdivided into a number of projects. The most important findings of it have been brought together in the conclusions that we present today. These conclusions are the result of lengthy and intensive discussions as of last summer within the editorial desks and the D Dutch Programme Council about the question, what are the connecting themes, what idea comes from all these studies and older literature, what are the lines and patterns that we can find. Step by step, the conclusions became visible, the conclusions that we as a Dutch research group uh, stand for. Maybe someone will place different nuances than the other. The purpose of this research was, first of all, to provide further analysis and explanation uh, 
to the nature of the military actions in Indonesia with a lot of attention to historical, political and international context, both for political and social aftermath of the war after 1950. This analysis and explanations have focused first of all on the use of extreme violence by the Dutch armed forces and the consequences. And second of all, to the question to what extent at that time and later on, people were held accountable politically and from a legal perspective for this violence. And what it directly shows is that research focuses on the broader historical processes. We are very well aware that personal memories and experiences can go to the background and some of uh, you might not recognize themselves in the conclusions that are presented today or even feel that it denies their own fate. But that is what war brings, in which people inevitably um, will see their own experiences. And of course, soldiers who were just sent and their lives were determined by the experiences at the front. Young men and women who joined the movement for independence. The Chinese um, East Indies woman whose parents perished in the earliest phase of the revolution, which we know in the Netherlands as Bersiap. The Indonesian veteran that is still seen as a hero, the Monacan Knil military who feel abandoned, but also the deserter who was in prison for years because he felt that the Netherlands did not have the right to occupy Indonesia again. So many different perspectives and experiences, they represent the human aspect. And in the research program, they are addressed not in the final conclusions, but in the sub-studies, starting with the book traces with the stories of witnesses and contemporaries of people in Indonesia and the Netherlands back to the most important goal of this research. We are not the first ones who have focused on this theme. I've already said that the attention for the war and Dutch violence has increased over the years. And this is what you see in uh, historic documentation. And we build on that. In this program, we aim to, first of all, bring together existing research and also further research, blind spot, like intelligence services, using heavy weaponry, extreme violence in the first phase of the revolution, the actions by the judiciary, communication from the battleground to The Hague, and history after 1950, but also the international perspective. Thirdly, we would like to give room to display different perspectives in the Netherlands and Indonesia to everyone who was part of this history and also give these people a voice. And we also aimed to strengthen the collaboration between Dutch and Indonesian researchers and we strived for a maximum use of a wide palette of sources in Indonesia, the Netherlands and other countries. And then finally, very important, we wanted, based on all the new research, generate new insights and present a coherent picture of this history of violence as far as it concerns the Netherlands. As said, in this research, it's about the question of extreme violence, but it also uh, gives cause to other questions, what is violence and what is extreme violence? So before we go into that, Gert Oost Indy will briefly say something about a number of projects that have focused on those blind spots. Thank you. What I'd like to do is I'd like to just focus on three sub projects. That is the Bursiap project, the project about international diplomacy and international comparison. First, the first thing. I'm sure you've heard about this over the past few weeks. There's been a great to-do about the Bursiap as a subject, uh, understandably so. So what did our researchers do? Well, they um, took the Bursiap period, as it is known in the Netherlands, and they tried to put it in a broader context, a broader context of extreme violence in the earliest period of the Indonesian Revolution. They arrived at a number of conclusions, and I'll explain two of them. First of all, 
it is a broad range of perpetrators and victims. When you look at the victims on the Dutch side, then they conclude that um, there's a maximum of 6,000 victims. That's a lot of victims, and it's very painful, but it's not the 20 or 30,000 that you also hear mentioned sometimes. <clears throat> and at the same time, and it's also an important point, that it's not uh, the case that... Um, Acting against the Bersia was the reason for the Netherlands to come back and reoccupy Indonesia. That decision had been made much earlier, um, straight off the bat in 1942. A second project I'd like to focus on is the international diplomacy. Just to briefly summarize, what is striking there, looking at the international community and how they viewed the Dutch actions, then... Dutch politicians were seen as very provincial. So the Netherlands had to be corrected uh, every time by the Netherlands, by the US, by the United Nations. The only Western country that was sympathetic to the Netherlands the whole time was France, and that was because France uh, was involved in a uh, similar colonial war in Indochina. Another important conclusion from this study is that all the international players said, you know, let's not focus too much on extreme violence. And why is that? Well, because that's not going to bring a solution at the negotiations table any closer. It makes it even more difficult. Let's not talk about that. That also means that a lot of things simply did not end up in the archives, and we'll see this later, so it's hard to determine exactly what happened. Then finally, there's an international group of people that we had look at what happened in comparable decolonization wars at that time or shortly after. That's um, England and Kenya, Malaysia, France in Indochina and later in Algeria. And what they concluded is that there was impunity. You know, extreme violence was not punished. You see that in all those di different cases. And if there's no punishment, then there's no prevention. Right, so those were some sub-projects, and let's now look at uh, the research as a whole. Then it's good to say that that concept of extreme violence uh, played a central role there. The focus of our research was on that, and we used that term, extreme violence, as an overarching term for really a whole range of different forms of violence. But they have one thing in common, which is that even measured by the standards of the time, um, they, ha they cross certain uh, legal or moral or ethical uh, boundaries. And the use of the term of extreme violence has another advantage. So it's a broad umbrella concept, but also it has no strict legal connotations. So that meant we could stay away from strictly legal interpretations of and discussions about the uh, military actions and the violence used in those actions. The extreme violence, as I was just saying, took many different forms. Mostly, it was committed outside of regular combat situations, or it took place in the margins of combat or military operations, often without a direct military necessity or without... Uh, people acting simply to protect themselves or defend themselves. So what we're talking about here is torture, execution without any kind of trial, physical abuse, rape, looting, and the destruction of uh, goods and property, detention under inhumane circumstances, violent reprisals like torching or, or shooting at kampongs, shooting civilians, and also mostly arbitrary mass uh, arrests and detentions. So the extreme violence could also take place within regular combat operations, and there we're mostly talking about the use of weaponry, heavy and light weaponry, in those cases where the use of violence has to be considered disproportionate and where often major 
risks of uh, civilian casualties were ignored. So what are our most important findings with regards to the use of extreme violence by the Dutch armed forces? Well, I will go over the three main ones. The first one is that the government position in response to the excessive nota, the Parliament Inquiry, inquiry 1966, that you know between 1945 and 1950, um, regrettable excesses had occurred, but that the armed forces as a whole in Indonesia um, acted correctly. Well, that position is no longer tenable. The second finding is that during the war, the Dutch armed forces used excessive, uh, extreme violence uh, in a structural way with all the uh, above mentioned forms of violence occurring. Extreme violence occurred frequently and was widespread. Then the third finding is that the politicians responsible as well as the military, civil, and judicial authorities tolerated or condoned this violence. They encouraged it or they concealed it, and they did not punish it or hardly punished it. So what kind of explanations can we give for the structural nature of this extreme violence? So I will go over the four main ones. Firstly, that the Dutch colonial underestimation of the political and military strength of, the, of Indonesian nationalism led to an unrealistic political and military strategy and to a willingness to use extreme violence in practice, that meant the following. The argument of military necessity in order to justify the extreme violence was stretched to a great degree. Secondly, it is good to point out that all armed parties used extreme violence, the British, the Japanese, the Dutch, and the Indonesians. Also against civilians and unarmed fighters. In many places, at many times, there was a clear spiral of violence. It was violence and counter-violence. It was terror and counter-terror. The third explanation is that that policy of condoning things by the authorities further encouraged this violence. And that's touching on that aspect of impunity that Gert Rost Indy um, already mentioned. Then the last explanation that, that I want to mention here at least is that the Dutch armed forces, physically, mentally, and conceptually speaking, were not sufficiently equipped to wage an extensive uh, guerrilla war. That also led to further violence. So to be more specific here, the army was, even just looking at the numbers, was too small to control to effectively control the extensive areas it had uh, reconquered. And it also had hardly any doctrine or hardly any idea of how it could fight uh, a guerrilla operation. So those were some of the explanations. A lot more could be said, but I'll give the floor again to Gert oost Indy, who I think will continue with the, the evidence. I have a few remarks uh, about the evidence. And then I will move towards a conclusion where I'll be repeating some things. But first about the evidence. The numbers of victims were very unevenly distributed, as we already knew. And of course, we looked at whether we could get further details there. That's another result of the study, 
where we say that's almost not possible. The source material, when it comes to victims, certainly on the Indonesian side, is very uh, fragmented, is, is incomplete. That was also part of the war conducted by the Dutch, you know, not making a note of things, not registering things, and if it is registered, then concealing it. That's part of the study makes that very clear. So we're not going to pretend that we have the hard data here. What we can say, and, and that is looking at the Dutch counting of the victims on their own side and on the Indonesian side, and then you get a ratio of 1 to 40. So one Dutch soldier being killed um, in combat uh, compared to 40 Indonesian. So that's very unequal. So it's a good indication of how heavily the Netherlands were fighting. And then the Indonesian use of violence, what can we say about that? Well, again, that wasn't the focus of our research. There can be no doubt that on the Indonesian side as well, a lot of extreme violence was used against the Dutch, but also amongst themselves. There can be no doubt about that. There's all kinds of sub projects where we did look at that, the regional studies project, for example, but also the projects to do with technical violence, with the intelligence services, the judiciary. So th that subject is covered there. But again, that wasn't the heart of our research. So uh, a good understanding of the Indonesian use of violence was, of course, necessary in order to be able to explain how the Dutch armed forces uh, acted in response. So then I'd like to just go back to the conclusions. First of all, during the war, the Dutch armed forces frequently and structurally used uh, extreme violence. Ms. Schoenmaker gave some examples of that. Secondly, the politicians responsible, as well as the military, civil, and uh, judicial authorities condoned this violence, promoted it, concealed it, and uh, punished it uh, hardly or at all. And of course, impunity is part of the explanation. Um, there was no effective prevention. Of course, that leads to another question, you know, who had the ultimate responsibility for all of this? Well, first, I'd like to say the following. We didn't really look, we didn't focus on individual uh, misconduct. That wasn't the heart of what we wanted to do. What we are saying is that the Dutch armed forces as an institution were responsible for that widespread and um, structural extreme violence. But of course, they acted in close consultation with and under the responsibility of the Dutch government. They had final responsibility. The buck stopped there. And then the second thing, just repeating what Ben Schoenmaker just said, that extreme violence was condoned, uh, tolerated, or concealed, or hardly punished by the authorities, so there was no preventative effect. Um, we're talking about institutional responsibilities there of the armed forces of the Dutch government. So we're not saying that there was no responsibility at an individual level, at the various levels. Uh, you know, soldiers in the field up to the highest commanders of the armed forces and the Dutch government. But we're trying to mostly focus on the institutions. During the war, um, people did not give sufficient account, did not face up to the violence they used themselves, and after the war, that pattern continued. So what you see in the first decades after the war is that the politicians are really covering their own actions. It's the same political parties and, in part, the same ministers, the same people responsible, political leaders, etc., who could have been open about their own failure. That they failed to do so is, is perhaps not surprising. But the question might be, why did it take so long after that? Why was it only in 69 that we got your Putin? Why after your Putin did things happen, but did a lot of things not happen? So there the explanation is different, because what happened then is by then the Dutch government, and rightly so, discovered that the veterans, the uh, Dutch Indo community, the Moluccan community, were outraged, were angry about the way in which they weren't welcomed by Dutch society. There was a lot of anger there. The government wanted to do something about that, with that. 
but that would run contrary to actually talking about the actual the, the violence used in Indonesia. So in that context, the Dutch government is very happy that the Indonesian government keeps saying, oh, we don't, we don't want you to do that, that's fine. But in the end, that is where the responsibility lies. You know, Dutch politicians did not take responsibility, did not want to be held, held to account for a long time. And there, Dutch politicians and the Dutch society as a whole found it very difficult to move away from that very rosy picture of itself, that rosy idea of itself. Well, we simply don't do that kind of thing. Thank you. Marion van der Veen, the vice Marion van den Veen will be the one who gives uh, people who want to ask a question the turn. You are saying that the position of the Dutch government from 69, that the armed forces in general uh, behaved correctly, that that position could no longer be maintained. So what should the government now do with the outcomes of this research? Well, that is fortunately not up to us to say. We come to scientific conclusions that have just been summarized that so far to this date, except for 1969, it was never addressed and the government never took another official position. So this is an invitation to politics as to what conclusions they're going to connect to it, but we're not doing that. Yes, but you obviously expect maybe a, a, a parliamentary debate or something along those lines. Uh, is this the third Rutte government? Well, it decided to finance, to subsidize this research, this project, and they felt that it was necessary, so it makes sense right now that we have the outcomes that this government acts on it, because they, they put the question to us. And I understand from reliable sources that even today something might actually happen, but we did not talk about this, we were not in touch about this. These are our findings. Frank Vermeulen, NRC newspaper. You say that they asked, the government asked you to do the research, but I understand that the questions came from you and it was the government who uh, paid or did the government give you commissioned you well okay oh, a reconstruction the book of Remy Limbach uh, was published in 2016 it led to political debate it resulted in all kinds of movements uh, between different parties the government in December I think it was the 2nd of December it decided it was willing to have research conducted and to finance it. And in that letter to Parliament outlined the framework as to what the research should comply with. And then we were the ones who created the program. We submitted the program and it was uh, approved by granting us 4.1 million to do the research. Okay, so was one of the conditions to not use any terms like war crimes and uh, crimes against humanities, but only extreme, viol uh, extreme violence, a new euphemism, just like police actions. The choice for extreme violence, well, a shortcut, the choice for using that com concept is an outcome that we came to with the researchers uh, in four years of discussion. And why? Yes, it would be very interesting to actually make a reconstruction of that debate. Initially, we uh, consulted international law experts. They held lectures as to how we should look at or could look at that history. And then we found out that we really had to stay away from concepts within international law because it is always changing international uh, law could still relate to colonial law and that changes of course or after 1945 with Nuremberg trials etc hold on let me finish that's one that's one so we 
stayed away from that legal context and terminology. The term war crime has a strict legal meaning. And what we wanted to look for was a much broader category. We did not want to limit ourselves to that only one category that could only legally qualify as war crimes. We wanted to take a broader perspective. We wanted to look at other uh, forms of extreme violence that at that time, by the people who were involved at that time, were considered, looking at the Van Rijen Stam book, that uh, at that time were already seen and considered as excessive compared to the standard and values that they themselves said they represented and they said wanted to follow. And then the concept extreme violence also include actions that you could qualify as war crimes. So it's a broader category than only war crimes. Uh, maybe you have something to add to that. Yes. Well, I wouldn't uh, want to qualify extreme violence as a euphemism. I don't think many people see it as a euphemism. That is not how we intended to use it, and this is not how we interpret it. Yes, but if we use a, a, a narrower legal concept, then you exclude a lot of other things. So take certain strategies that traditionally in colonial warfare were common uh, using violence, uh, shelling a population, shelling people who throw rocks back at you. Is that a war crime? Well, if you start proving that, then you know you get stuck. But we wanted to uh, really include all types of violence. Also, to be able to look at continuity from before 1945 and then after 1945, to be able to describe all matters that would be excluded if you'd only adhere to that strict legal category of war crimes. And maybe we should not get stuck here. It's not that we reject the concept of war crimes. I yesterday, um, of course, yesterday I said, someone asked me, are these war crimes? Yes, that might well qualify. You know, if you uh, detain someone without any form of process, yes. You know, but if you place that in the context of that time with a different legal framework that was in place, at that time, then we look at the broader actions. Did you also, my name is Hans Moll, Federation uh, Dutch Indos. Um, did you also look into uh, the actions of KL and KNIL uh, and the number of civilian victims, whether that decreased the beginning of uh, Bersiap, 6,000 victims, much more victims under the Indonesian population. Did you also look into whether those numbers decreased over the course of time? You're looking at me, so I'm assuming that you're asking me. Um, so you are referring to the Bersiap violence? I am talking about victims, both Indonesian and Dutch Indo. So first ref referring to 6,000, then second phase, many more. But over the course of time, well, this happened. But did you also discover a decrease in victims? And if so, is that because of the Dutch forces? Well, I have a question to you. The number of victims on the Dutch uh, Indo-side decreases significantly, but the number of victims on the Indonesian side only increases. You know, we referred to uh, large numbers of which we do not know because of the incomplete reporting on the Dutch side and disabling us to uh, ascertain uh, how many victims uh, were there and who they were. Uh, so many more victims on the Indonesian side. So Bersiap for me also means violence of Indonesians to Indonesians. So maybe there are estimates uh, about that. I don't know if you did. That's, that is what I've just said. There is no doubt about the fact that there was uh, Indonesian violence and any, anything else would be uh, 
speculation. You can also say the reverse. If the Netherlands had not started uh, going into that war, then after that, uh, you know, we would have. But that's speculation. Something else. Also with historic demographics, we also try to discover what the impact of the war was from 45 to 49. And if you look at it from that perspective, it's millions of victims. But that is very hard to research. We, uh, I mean, there were many causes. Uh, there is famine, there is blockades. Um, but this doesn't trivialize any violence or any victim. Well, you could also wonder why using Dutch troops did not lead to people being saved. Well, of course, wherever the Netherlands was in charge and the Republic accepted it, there was indeed less victims because it was calmer. But on the other side, especially using Dutch armed forces meant four years of war. And in that war, that's the bigger picture, and in that war we see many victims. Marcel Fink, Telegraph newspaper. It's a question to all three of you. Did you consider to not include the violence in a sub-project on Indonesia's side, I mean, and but in the big research project? Well, this is a story that has been going on for a while that, you know, that we allegedly only focus on Dutch violence, which is absolutely not the case. Please read the chapters about the intelligence services. That is absolutely about both sides. This is the exact context within which the military, the Dutch military had to operate. The focus is on using uh, violence on the Dutch side, extreme violence in particular, but in the context of the entire situation, which is addressed in all those sub-studies. Um, that is the context in which this violence takes place. But, no, not a separate project. Remark inaudible to the interpreter. My name is uh, Leonard Ornstein, VPRO broadcaster. I have a question about collective debt. On the 14th of June 1995, in Parliament, there was a meeting with the State Secretary of uh, Defence, Gemeen Ligmein, and the uh, public uh, stage was taken by people who were directly involved in the uh, in war on independence. And there was a lot of um, outrage, and they were at that debate. And there was a representative from the Labour Party, Martin Zelstra, and he said the Dutch politics and the Dutch society have uh, severely sold the, uh, in, uh, the military short. Uh, and wrongly qualified this as police action. On the Dutch side, there were 6,000 victims. Whoever came back got 10 guilders a month for the fact that they stayed in Indonesia. Those who were captured could actually not even qualify for benefits. And Martin Zelstra, sometimes it is as if Dutch fighters misbehaved in Indonesia, but on both sides, things happened that could not be tolerated. And now we have your report to say that as well. But now the core quote of Zelstra, June 1995, the government has to make very clear that as a group, these uh, soldiers cannot be blamed for anything. I read a summary of your report yesterday, and this is also about moral dilemmas. So to what extent can you qualify all these veterans as being exactly the same and deem them collectively guilty of what you qualify as structural uh, excessive war violence? Well, the answer is simple. You cannot say that all soldiers and all veterans are guilty and 
these are maybe men that are already 19 year, 90 years old. It's, it's a stressful day. They might have the feeling that they're taking a stand in a criminal process, but our conclusions do not lead, absolutely do not lead to that, saying that you can qualify all veterans as being collectively guilty. That is not what we write, and this is explicitly not what we say. And uh, we tried to emphasize this, you know, when it is about structural violence, it's not only that structural element is not only in the frequency, but especially armed forces. Armed forces, the military is an institution, and it's also about that institution and how it dealt with that violence and how the authorities acted. And that, for us, is the most important part of our statement. And I think my colleague here, Gert, also said this. That responsibility is very layered and fragmented. Uh, of course, there were soldiers that completely went beyond the pale. That violence was committed, and we need to acknowledge that. But it doesn't mean that you need to qualify an entire group of soldiers or veterans as being guilty of that. And we explicitly do not do this. And again, it is very interesting. We actually talked to a lot of veterans. And, you know, we were not in an ivory tower, if you... Uh, we're thinking that veterans have been a very important source to us. And the first thing that stands out is how varied the memories of these veterans themselves are. And I would like to, again, emphasize that we owe it to the veterans as well. And we thank them for their documents, their memoirs, their interviews, their diaries. They are of invaluable value when it comes to being able to look at the dark side of the conflict, they have been a very important source. And at the same time, the veterans also say that they themselves never experienced any extreme violence and that they had never heard about it. So there is a, a, a huge variety, uh, uh, an entire palette of memories that we should all respect. But based on your research and the conclusions that a Labour Party representative Zelstra said, that as a group they cannot be blamed, can you still maintain that position? Well, we just said that you shouldn't blame them as a group. Then the other, the reverse is also not that simple. It's not, when it comes to responsibility in the end, um, you can look at what an individual has contributed to that. But again, at that level, it, we do not analyze that level. We look at structural aspects to that violence, like Gert already said. Yes, maybe I can make another comment. And we've said, in the end, there is political responsibility during the war for all the war violence. And then in the aftermath, there is political responsibility that has to deal with the uh, willingness to face up to what happened. And for a long time, the completely justified concern for the Dutch in the community and the Moluccans was used as an excuse to not having to face up to that. And that quote or argument from 1995, I, I'm not sure whether it was meant like that, but this is what it was like for a long time. Let's not look at it. And that is indeed what we step away from. Again, the word or concept, you know, armed forces as an institution, that is exactly how you should understand it. Not the armed forces, including everybody, no, as an institution. And I believe that I think we have also made it very specific in our publication. And there's a reason for that. Well, the complicated thing about this, if you look at what happened after German occupation, you know, we had the Nuremberg trials. South Africa had its Wahrheit Committee. 
the Truth Finding Committee. Truth and Reconciliation. Um, making sure that uh, individual war crimes were left unpunished, but that a collective group now is responsible for it. And that is what Selstra alluded to. Well, this is exactly what we're not doing, because you say there's an impression, but that impression is not reflected in our book. Is, uh, hi, I have two questions about the BERSIAP. So today, in the report, you've given an exact number, 6,000 or thereabouts. So that is quite a lot less than, for example, the Bustamaka research, also Frederick and Crip, what they said on the subject, they talked about 20 to 30,000 dead. So what is the reason for that? Why is your number so much less? Well, what the researchers did is they went back to the sources. The sources that the first figures were based on, and those first figures were about the same as our figures. And they also analyzed the arguments and the reasonings that, you know, the other figures were based on 20,000, I think, was Clip, and 30,000 was Frederick. And they were able to show what those extrapolations, because that's what they were, what they were based on, and they were able to show as well that those extrapolations were not uh, sufficiently substantiated. And on that basis, they arrived at a recalculation of three and a half thousand victims or thereabouts, of which it's been determined that they were killed. Though a thousand of them didn't die by violence, uh, but died because of other circumstances. And then to, add to that, you can add 2,000 people whose fate is not exactly known. So that brings them to a number of about 6,000. And then they're assuming that those 2,000 missing have also died. But there's no reason to insist on those extrapolations. And Robert Gripp, who was part of the um, scientific committee, uh, is convinced that this is the correct, correct way of reasoning. So of his own numbers, he said, no, I'm convinced now that my estimates were incorrect. All right. So then are you really saying that both Frederick and, and Crip and Bussemaker in the past simply didn't do their job correctly? Well, they tried. They didn't go back to the sources that were available, which Lu De Jong did, and uh, Lu De Jong arrived at that number of 5,000. Of course, they went back to all available sources and then arrived at this number. And you're saying as well that the Bursia played no part in deciding to send troops, and there you referred to... Uh, articles in the press, in the media, from the 80s onwards. Isn't that a bit of a paper reality? Because, of course, the troops were sent uh, officially with uh, the reason being, you know, restoring order. What did the Dutch government mean by that then? Was it just propaganda? Well, so what it was about is that those sources from the 80s, that was a lot of veterans who wrote down in their memoirs, you know, we were said to uh, Dutch East Indias because the Bersiep was there. So it was very important that we had to go back there to protect innocent civilians. What the researchers in this sub-project said, you know, let's have a close look at that. When did that concept become relevant? And that was long after the Second World War. And we also said that for the Netherlands, I mean, you know the history, 1940, Germany... Uh, invaded the Netherlands in 1942, Japan occupied the colony. In the end, that is de facto, that's the end of the um, colonial period, but the Netherlands doesn't want it to be. And during the Second World War, is already saying, you know, after the war, how are we going to uh, reconquer the Dutch East Indies? So they've planned that long before the Bershiap even starts. I understand that, but you say this very insistently. The Bursia played no part in sending troops. I think that's an exaggeration. Well, just to be clear, the Bursia took place when only the Knil uh, was uh, in Indonesia. There's, you can say, you know, terrible things are happening there. That was clear. 
and they do play a part later in, you know, demonizing the Indonesian opponents. Just look at the terrible things they're doing. We really have to go back there. And that whole narrative of restoring order, bringing peace, that fits in with that. And what researchers have rightly said is that, well, it's not the case that, you know, first you had the Persiap and then the Netherlands decided, oh, we have to get back there. Then, uh, uh, last question. So this, we were just talking about sources. So all the written sources that were used by the researchers, will they all be publicly available? Publicly accessible? Because there are a lot of things that are completely inaccessible or only have restricted access for reasons of privacy, etc. I, I honestly don't know. I think... You know, sources that our researchers can access can be accessed by others as well. That's not been my experience. Well, when we're talking about these sources in Dutch archives, some of them have restricted access. That's up to the state, to the National Archives. That's not up to us. Were researchers able to access those, though? Yes, we were able to access everything, and to a larger and larger degree, those sources are opening up to other researchers, uh, to all researchers, and in the course of the project, new sources were generated or found, and they're now with the NIOT and NIMH, and they're now accessible to everyone. Yet there's a large collection of ego documents uh, that was gathered. We were working on that before 2016. Of course, they can be consulted by other researchers as well. We're now digitizing it too, so they'll be uh, available online too. So we will definitely... Uh, insofar as it's in our power, we will definitely be uh, making all those uh, sources publicly available. Okay, well, I hope that will be the case. That was the last question. So that brings us to the end of this very long presentation for those who've been here from the start. <laughs> If you have any questions, uh, this applies to the journalist here. It also applies to people watching at home. If you have questions for the researchers or for the entire program group, uh, you can keep asking those questions. I'll repeat the email address one more time, info at ind45-50.nl, and we'll try and answer all those questions with the necessary care. And then finally, I'm going to just say it one more time because this is quite a big deal. We can very much imagine that the presentation of these results has led to strong emotions. If you want to discuss them with someone, then you can contact the Polita Foundation via phone number 0883305111. You see the number on your screen. And veterans and their loved ones can also go to the Veterans Desk of the Dutch Veterans Institute. They can be reached on phone number 0883340000. So thank you for your attention.